So I have a question. It's actually the same question I've had for the last 25 years. Do media have the power to make peace? So in order to address that question, I'm going to make five points and conclude with my new vision. So typically, when I ask people this question, they say that the answer is yes. And what they'll do is they'll point to examples from media, meaning mass communication, and more broadly, also interpersonal communication. And they'll give me an example of some TV episode they saw, or maybe a post they read in social media, or a speech they heard in which someone advocated for peace. And based on that, they'll say, yes, media have the power to make peace. But here's the thing. There's actually no conclusive evidence to that effect. And the reason for that is there's been very little research conducted to try to answer that question. And most of the research that actually exists is not what is called assessment and evaluation research. That is research that directly tries to determine whether what you came across, say, in a social media post, if that's influencing your attitudes, beliefs, or peace-relevant behaviors. What I mean by that is that in order to determine if media actually have an impact on peace, you need to know, is it impacting someone in such a way that they are, it's causing them to hate their enemies less? Is it causing them to have different political beliefs about who is responsible in a conflict? Or, most importantly, is it changing their behavior, say, to join a protest? Or, if peace accords are in process, to vote differently than they would have had they not interacted with that peace message? So, as I said, I've been interested in this question for the last 25 years. Uh, around that time, in the 1990s, I had been working as a practitioner for a number of uh, media organizations, conflict management organizations, as well as for the United Nations, where essentially I was running these kinds of peace media interventions. Now, what became apparent to me is that these kinds of interventions, they've existed since the 1940s. So today, they've existed now for 90 years. But scholars weren't actually interested in assessing and evaluating them until about the turn of the century, which was 20 years ago. That means we have a knowledge gap of 70 years. And that's why we don't have a actual research to answer this question. And now, even among the little bit of research that exists, the assessment and evaluation research that exists, most of that focuses on peace building, not peacemaking. Namely, whether message, messages can foster friendship not whether they can change people's political beliefs. And the thing is, political beliefs are essential to change. Political beliefs about core issues surrounding inequitable resource distribution and perceptions about that. If political beliefs are not changed, peace cannot be made. So therein is the issue why, the first point that I'm making, that there hasn't been any conclusive evidence to answer that question whether media make peace. The second point I want to make is that there is evidence from analogous research about health media campaigns that suggests media interventions can have no impact at all, meaning if you're running them, you're just throwing money down the drain. So scholars who've studied smoking secession campaigns have effectively shown that Telling someone who smokes that smoking is bad for them has no impact on their behaviors. Because newsflash, everyone who smokes already knows it's bad for them. So if you actually want to get them to quit, you have to adopt a new strategy. So that's the second point. Media interventions may not have any impact. The third point is that there's also evidence from analogous assessment and evaluation research about humanitarian interventions that suggests you can actually create more harm than good. So research that was conducted around the time of the Rwandan genocide showed that very well-meaning aid practitioners actually inadvertently aided the genocide. So what they did is they intervened into Rwanda and they supplied resources to Hutus who already had more resources and also had reasons tied to Rwanda's precursor colonial history to enact revenge against Tutsis. So what happened? Those aid practitioners who were trying to foster socioeconomic development instead inadvertently aided a genocide. So it's because of vexing concerns like this that 
I felt we really need to answer this question, do media have the power to make peace, right? We have no conclusive evidence about that question. There's analogous evidence that you can have no impact, that you're just throw throwing money down the drain, and you can create more harm than good. That's why in the late 90s, I decided to become a scholar and as I saw, no one was answering this question. It became apparent to me that I guess I needed to if I wanted to know the answer and felt really passionate about it. So at that time, I started to advocate a subdiscipline that I call peace communication that's dedicated to precisely procuring assessment evaluation evidence to answer this question. Now, in order to try to answer this question, I conducted a major study. I started that in 2001 until 2011, so it spanned 10 years. But really, the bulk of it I conducted from 2004 to 2006 with a follow-up in 2011. So what I did is I picked an intervention that I felt was the best design intervention in existence at that time, because naturally there's a most to learn from it. And the reason why it was the best design intervention, in my opinion, is that it was unusually the only one that actually incorporated any kind of assessment, evaluation, behavior change evidence, namely from analogous research. The second thing about this intervention is that it was targeted to children. Now, children typically make up anywhere from half to the majority of conflict zone-based populations. So it's them, rather than adults, who really experience daily life in a conflict. So for these reasons, I felt this intervention offered the best, you know, the most to learn from. And so I proceeded to conduct an assessment evaluation of it. Now, what is this intervention? Well, it's actually a version of Sesame Street um, that was targeted to Israeli and Palestinian children. Now, for you to understand the study and what I learned from it, let me first tell you a little bit about these um, media interventions, these Sesame Streets. So number one, Israeli and Palestinian Sesame Street was produced by four production teams. An Israeli team, a Palestinian team, an American team in its first season. In its second season, it also brought on a Jordanian production team. Now, as a peace media intervention, it transpired over two seasons, so I study those two seasons in combination. The second point to know about uh, the Sesame Streets is that unlike all other Sesame Streets around the world, it operated on two streets rather than one, meaning on a Palestinian and an Israeli street. So these Sesame Streets basically envisioned the end result of the Oslo Accords between Israelis and Palestinians that sought to achieve what was known in the nomenclature as a two-state solution, namely where a Palestinian state would exist side by side in peace with an Israeli state. So Sesame Street created a two-street solution. And the set design, therefore, envisioned the resolution of the conflict, right? There was no conflict, peace had been made, which obviously, in reality, it hadn't been made, and as I'm sure all of you know, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has still not been resolved. But that is the vision they wanted to give to the children. The third point to know about it is that it operated in both Arabic and Hebrew. And fourthly, like all other Sesame Streets around the world, it sought to instill early childhood development skills in its audience, like reading, writing, arithmetic, basic social skills, but what it added there was also an area called mutual respect, and that's where it focused on peace building. Now, to portray peace building, what they did, and you could see here on the screen on the left side um, some examples of the characters from Israeli Sesame Street, and on the right side some examples of the characters from Palestinian Street, Palestinian Sesame Street. What they did is they essentially created characters who were non-stereotypical representations of Israelis and Palestinians and scripted them in as all good-natured human beings. And then they would show them interacting with one another, where Israelis would go visit the Palestinian street and Palestinians would go visit the Israeli street and they would interact together peacefully to model that for the audience in the hope that they would emulate that. So, as I said, I conducted a study of this and I want to know what the audience took away from it. So in order to do that, I lived in several Israeli and Palestinian communities where I conducted what scholars call an ethnography in order to make sense of these children's daily lives amid conflict. I would then go to the children's homes, I would interact with them and their families. I would then interview the children to try to make sense of how they made sense of the conflict. And then I would show them a mock episode of the program and watch alongside them. After that, I would then ask them questions to figure out what it is they took away from the program. 
So I would use this toolkit-like game board, or this game board, um, to help facilitate our conversation. And as part of that, I also gave the children the opportunity to respond, not just verbally, but through drawing form. And this is all something typical that scholars do when they conduct research with children this age, who in my study were five to eight. Now, in order to make sense of what they understood about the series, as I mentioned beforehand, I first asked them um, what they understood about the conflict and how they perceived their partners to conflict. So, to do that, I would start out, first of all, by asking the Palestinian children, can you tell me who or what is a Jewish Israeli? Now, that's not really a term that's used locally, so they couldn't really answer that. So I'd say, how about someone who's Jewish? And they would say, yes. Someone who is Jewish is a member of an army. In other words, they were, the way they defined someone who was Jewish was, for example, not as a member of a nation, not as a member of a religious group, not even as a people, but rather unidimensionally, only as members of an army. They would then proceed to draw this kind of image of an adult dressed in a khaki-colored military uniform. When I asked the Jewish Israeli children the same question, namely, can you tell me who or what is a Palestinian, um, they would respond blankly. They just didn't respond, and I'm thinking, what's going on here? Like, why don't you know what a Palestinian is? So I didn't, I'd encourage them, and I'd say, are you sure you don't know? And then they would say, oh, yeah, you mean a terrorist. Yeah, I know what a Palestinian is. And I would say, okay. So in their case, they define Palestinians not, for example, as a nation, not an ethnic group, and not even a people. They instead define them unidimensionally as terrorists. So both of them, as you can see, had very negative stereotypes of one another. Now, when I went on, and I'm sorry, when I, they, I asked the Jewish Israeli children to draw their stereotype, they drew this kind of image of an adult clad in a ski cap, which was their representation of a terrorist. Now, when I went on to ask them about the interpretation of the show, I um, would ask first the Palestinian children to tell me what it is they saw in the show. For example, do they see anyone Jewish in it? So the Palestinian children would tell me no. I didn't see anyone dressed in military uniform, therefore there were no Jews in Sesame Street. I would then ask the Jewish Israeli children the same question, did you see any Palestinians in the show? And they would say no. In their case, the answer they provided, they would start out by telling me, you know, this is an Israeli show. Despite what I told you earlier that the series was actually produced by four production teams, they assumed it was only Israeli made, and by that they specifically meant Jewish Israeli. And um, then they would go on to answer my question, and they'd answer it in a way which they thought the answer was obvious and even my question was stupid, where they would say this. So, you know, it's an Israeli-made production, and obviously Israelis care about us, so they're not going to put someone on the show who would harm us, so they're not going to put a terrorist on, duh. So, no, there were no Palestinians in the show. So this brings me to my fourth point. Audiences interpret information in a myriad of ways. Their attitudes or beliefs will not necessarily be affected or their peace-relevant behaviors. So pointing to, say, a speech you heard on TV as evidence that media can make peace isn't, because audiences interpret things in all kinds of ways, as you just heard. Now, what happened here for the Palestinian children, what they saw on Sesame Street, these non-stereotypical portrayals of good-natured Jewish Israelis, just did not square with their stereotypes of someone who's quote-unquote Jewish, right? The, the particular stereotype they evinced. It also didn't square with their intertwined political beliefs that we also discussed, in which they told me who they felt was responsible for the destruction around them, their, and who was responsible for their freedoms and self-autonomy, or rather, lack thereof, as they explained it to me. Likewise, for the Jewish-Israeli children, the portrayal, the non-stereotypical portrayal of Palestinians on Sesame Street, didn't square with their stereotypes. Nor did it square with their intertwined political beliefs about who they felt was responsible for the conflict. So this is what ultimately happened. Now, I can go on and say, 
a lot about why this happened. I can also talk about the recommendations that I make for the improvement, not just of Israeli and Palestinian Sesame Street, but peace media interventions around the world. And that's something I talk about in a book that I've just written. And one of the things I note is that peace media interventions cannot be effective unless all parties to conflict's definition of peace is included. And that might be, typically, either justice, equality, or security. If all those definitions for peace are not encoded into an intervention, it will not have an impact on all parties to a conflict. Now, rather than get into greater detail about that, what I want to do right now in my remaining time is get to my fourth point, which is to return to my original question. Do media have the power to impact peace? Well, after this study and everything I know today, my answer to that is, not necessarily, at least as so far as we know today. What I do know is that if evidence-based practice is generated, we would know much more. And this is where I get to my new vision that I want to conclude with. What if a new organization were created that encouraged evidence-based practice? What if it encouraged more scholars to conduct the needed assessment evaluation evidence or research to determine whether media can impact peace, and what if that organization paired them with scholars to generate evidence-based practice? If that happened, one of two things would occur. Either we would know conclusively that media do not have the power to impact peace, in which case I would say we shouldn't run these programs anymore, that's money thrown down the drain. Or we would learn that these programs can be effective and we would actually improve them. Now, none of that can occur without support. That's where policymakers and donors come in. If policymakers signal their support for this kind of effort, that would go a long way in increasing the probability that peace media interventions would be successful. If donors help fund it, that would also obviously increase the effect. Now, typically, the organizations that run these interventions, media and conflict management organizations, are not-for-profit organizations. They, like scholars, don't have money for this. On the other hand, for-profit media organizations, like high-tech companies, do, as do other donors who are already funding these efforts. So, if they provided the funding, we might see this kind of organization. Now, I'm not suggesting they provide more funding than they're already providing. What I'm suggesting is that they create a new funding model. Instead of continuing to fund scholars and practitioners separately, if they made funding contingent on them working together, we might see a change. We might see the generation of evidence-based practice. Now, I've been dreaming about creating an organization like this for years, but it's not something I can do alone. So if this is something that resonates with you, I would love to hear from you. Thank you.